This week in IT, Windows 11 is ready, but are you? And the One Outlook client is officially here. So Microsoft announced this week that Windows 11 is now ready for broad deployment. So what it means is that any eligible Windows 10 users are now able to install Windows 11 without any restrictions from Microsoft. So providing that your hardware is compatible, you can choose to install Windows 11 if you like. Now this is usually announced by Microsoft about six months after the initial general availability of a feature update. So now of course is about the right time. And Windows 11 Sun Valley 2, which should be available sometime in the fall, we think now is pretty much ready. And the current build in the beta channel is most likely to be the RTM build for that version of Windows. Now at the moment, the generally available version of Windows is Sun Valley or Sun Valley 1, if you like. The version that will come later in the year will probably be called version 22H2. And Microsoft is already working on Sun Valley 3, which should come in 2023. Now, because Sun Valley 2 is pretty much already ready, there's going to be a long period before it's potentially available. Now, of course, Microsoft could make it available sooner, but there are also some features that Microsoft has talked about recently, like tabs in File Explorer, which aren't in Sun Valley 2 or the current version of Sun Valley 3. Now, it might be, of course, that Microsoft ships these features outside of a feature update and have the delivery mechanisms in place to do that potentially. So it'll be interesting to see how Microsoft delivers these features going forwards. And of course, they may well do that out of the yearly feature updates that they've promised for Windows 11. Now, last week, the One Outlook client, the new client that Microsoft is working on for Outlook, was accidentally leaked onto the web. But this week, it's been officially released for those users that have a commercial account. So that's a work or school account in Microsoft 365 if you're on the Office Insiders beta channel. Now, this new client, as I said last week, is basically just what you have in Outlook on the web at the moment. But Microsoft does have a roadmap and there are lots of things that are gonna be coming in the future. So we have in development things like multi-account support, support for Gmail, iCloud, and other IMAP services. And for some existing Outlook features, which you get in the current desktop client, like Quick Steps, for instance. And Microsoft is also planning to add to this new client support for PST files, folder reordering, and support for the US government cloud. Now, in the language that Microsoft has been using about this release, it seems to me that this is actually going to replace the desktop client that we have today. And while they're not explicitly saying that, from the language, it really does seem like this is going to be a real unified client that's going to replace that legacy desktop you know, huge monolithic app that we have as part of Microsoft 365 today. But of course, probably when this does get officially released, there's going to be some feature regression, like what about support for COM add-ins and all that kind of stuff. So I can't really see the legacy desktop app completely disappearing for many years. I think that Microsoft will probably offer these two apps together initially and say, well, look, this is the new app, but the legacy desktop app is still there if you want it or need it. And of course, you know, until the one Outlook client reaches feature parity with what we have today, I think that will be the situation. Now, following on from a story last week connected to Patch Tuesday, there were some problems for organizations that were using things like remote access services and network policy server on Active Directory domain controllers in the last week's Patch Tuesday updates broke that certificate authentication that's required for those services. And CISA was even warning organizations, you better not install this update. Now, literally just before I started recording, Recording this, Microsoft announced out-of-band updates for Windows Server 2016 through to Windows Server 2022 that will address this problem. So you should be able to get these out-of-band updates installed and hopefully not experience this problem. But like anything, please make sure that you do your own testing to make sure that these new updates don't negatively impact your environment. So back in 2019, Microsoft introduced some changes to licensing that made it more expensive to run its products like Windows Server, uh, Office, those kind of things in the cloud, but on competing cloud platforms. Now Microsoft has announced this week that it's going to change that, that it's going to make it fairer across the board so that if you want to run its products on a competitor's cloud platform, 
you can do that. Now, the current announcement is for Europe at the moment, I guess because Europe are pressuring somewhere to make sure that that happens. But Microsoft has said that this can apply across the globe, and it just happens that they're announcing this change in Europe first. And still on the subject of the cloud, Microsoft and Citrix announced a partnership this week where Citrix will be bringing its high definition experience technology to Windows 365 cloud PCs. Now, what does it mean high definition you know, end user experience? So this is things like, you know, high definition graphics. So if you're using, I don't know, Photoshop or AutoCAD or things like that, this helps to enable those technologies to work better across the remote connection. There's optimization for audio and video performance. And it also allows organizations to apply granular policy to improve security and corporate data protection. So let's move on to hoo-ha of the week, one of my favorite sections. And again, we're talking about Quick Assist. So what's going on with Quick Assist? So many IT admins have been really upset about what Microsoft this week has been doing with this tool. So this all originates really from a story about a new tool that Microsoft announced probably already a month ago called Remote Help. And basically this is the same as Quick Assist with a few extra bits and pieces to make it easier for corporations to help their, you know, and assist their remote users. But the bad news is that you have to pay $3 per user and helper to license this tool. Now, along with that announcement, Microsoft announced that they were going to discontinue support for the Quick Assist app that's currently built into Windows 10, Windows 11. And basically, they're going to make a new version of that app that you have to install via the Microsoft Store. Now, of course, there are a couple of problems with this. So, of course, if you're in an organization that doesn't have all of those Microsoft 365 subscriptions and things, now, in order to provide that kind of assistance, the first thing you're going to have to do is instruct the user to install Quick Assist, the new version of the app, from the store. Now, it's available in the store, you know, I think as of this week, but the problem that people have noticed is that it installs the app right next to the native app, which is currently still in Windows 10 and Windows 11. So you essentially get two versions of Quick Assist. So the question is, you know, if you're trying to support an end user, which version of the app do they click on? The second problem is that in order to install this new Quick Assist app, you have to provide administrative privileges. Now, of course, in some organizations, users don't have those. Now, somebody at Microsoft has spoken about this and said they're aware of these issues, and hopefully they're going to try and do something to solve those problems. What a mess Microsoft has made of this. They're saying that there is a version available in the Microsoft Store for Business, and the version in the Store for Business is an offline version version that customers can install. But that's not going to work in all environments, of course. And in a survey this week that was carried out in the US across 500 companies to discover you know, how the pandemic has changed how companies hire IT staff, it's been discovered that up to 59 of employers are considering eliminating requirements for people who come into IT to have any kind of college degree. And 30% of employers believe that getting rid of that requirement will help them to get a more diverse workforce. But employers have also said if they drop the requirements for a college degree, then they're going to become more specific about the skills that those workers have before they can be employed. Now, my point of view is that, you know, if you're coming into the industry, then IT certifications, you know, are a real bonus and are possibly more important than a college degree. But of course, it depends what kind of job you want, because a college degree, at least in the UK, was always a gateway into graduate programs and things like that in large corporations that if you didn't have a college degree were, you know, impossible to access. So we'll see how all of this works out. But it looks like HR is becoming more flexible about how they hire IT people because, of course, of the massive skill shortage. And according to the survey, 87% of companies say that they're just not ready to address that skills gap right now. So it'll be interesting to see how that changes in the future. If you found the content in the video useful, then please give it a like. It really helps us to get the video seen by more people. And if you'd like to see more of this news roundup content every week, then please subscribe to the channel. But that's it from me this week, and I'll see you next time.